Hey everyone, welcome back to Purple Noon, a podcast. I am Stephanie Conti, and I am here with the Mouchette to my Dani San. I almost said I Stephanie Conti. Lina- L- 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 Savannah Linause. That's your name. That's probably the worst one yet. <laughs> <laughs> like. Because I almost said the Donna San to Michette, Stephanie Conti. I wow. Could you imagine if I introduced myself twice? How awful that would have been. I. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Well, um, I'm sorry. I could not figure out a better. It's a rough. It's a rough one. It's okay. It's a rough okay. reference, but I mean nothing by it. It's just. It's. It's just how I introduce things. I'm sorry that the characters <laughs> are the farthest thing away from saintly. So before we get into that, today we are going to be talking about a film called Under the Sun of Satan. Now, before we do our review, you guys know that we like to do a little bit of intro or tell a story, whatever it may be. For this one, I want to talk about um, a detail after the story had happened. And it kind of, it, I will say, it did feel like re- while reading it, I was like, that's a Lars von Trier moment. If I know one. Oof, so I don't know exactly what happened. I did read somewhere that like there was booing and walking out, but and I believe it was because of something of the director, right? Not none so, of the actors. So get this, yeah. So this film won in the 80s, uh Palm the Palm d'Or, best film. And the director, he goes up stage, blah blah blah, all happily. And people started whistling and booing. I don't know if whistling, like, they they noted whistling. I don't know if it was, like, I don't know if there's, like, a bad version of whistling. Usually when I hear, like, think of whistling. But they were saying it was a bad whistling. Like, they weren't (laughs) saying, like, like, Like you know, that type of whistle. Like Like that? uh, It it has to be more aggressive. Like, like, it it would have to be, like, something that (laughs) didn't make sense. But anyways... In the sea of booze, it was just whistle and booze. So in the sea of booze and whistles, the director just looks at a crowd and he raises his fist up into the air and goes, I don't care if you like me because I don't like you either. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Okay. Tell me the business. Well, 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 what? Why were they booing? What did I miss? Because sometimes, no, it, 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 they just didn't think it deserved, because it was a unanimous decision for this movie to be, to win the Palme d'Or. Oh, so wow. I, I don't think this film was well received. And even if you look at like IMDb and other um, film reviewing sites, it's very mixed. Some will say it's a fantastic film and it deserved it. Some will say it's a mediocre film. Um, so yeah, mm. so he pulls a Lars von Trier. And I say that because Lars von Trier flicked everyone off <laughs> when he <laughs> didn't win the cons uh, Palm Palme d'Or. We're bringing back Lars for, Vaughn. <laughs> I think it was anything. for <laughs> I think it was for Europa is where he flicked everyone off because he thought he was gonna win <laughs> the Palm right, d'Or. Well, I mean, if we're gonna be honest. Europa did deserve it a little bit more than this film. So for I can honest. see that. I can see that. I mean, it's um, not an appropriate response at all. I'm not condoning flicking anybody off. How did he get off. back? How did they let him back? That's my <laughs> question. I mean, you. I mean, let's be honest. They, as much as I don't care for Lars, they've let a l- worse people let him back. Worse. That is true. That is indeed true. Um, and it, it's it, like that Europa episode we were, we were discussing, you know, at one point, do we kind of, there's always this huge debate on when do we separate the art from the artist? And at the time, it mm-hmm. seemed like you had to go like, especially from like eighties to nineties today. No, like it's not going to stand thanks to the me too movement, which I applaud. Um, but like, I feel like Lars von Trier could have spat in everyone's faces and he still could have gone to the Cannes Film (laughs) Festival, you know? Even, um, well, uh, Bjork in one of his films, I don't know how we got into Lars, but anyway, Bjork in his film, um, Dancer in the Dark, would spit in his face every day and said, I despise you, and would act. So, and that's that's still, that got Oscar nominations. That did get Oscar nominations. New York doesn't seem like a problematic person, right? No, 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 no. That's when you know there's an issue. But yeah, so this dude, he had, he pulled the Lars before Lars. This was like 10 years before 
um, Lars's <laughs> flick off stuuff. Could you imagine just being in the crowd and then like all of a sudden like a director like in the sea of people like just to your right just stands up and is just flicking off <laughs> and it's like, who's that? Oh, that's the director of the film. Like it's just so crazy. <laughs> it's so crazy. Um, that's crazy though. I, I wouldn't think like, cause I've heard of like, you know, some films being booed or people walking out because of, in protest of something the actor did or sometimes like controversial <coughs> movies, but mm-hmm. I, I've never heard of a movie being booed just because the audience didn't agree. That's well, really interesting. Yeah. Oh, apparently. So I looked it up. Apparently he was banned. Lars was banned for seven years, but um, the director of this film didn't have any other films afterwards that went to the thing. <clears throat> Ooh, sorry. You know when you get that like weird catch in your throat, and it's just like you feel like it's something like is pulling your trachea down. Am I making? Yeah. No, I'm not making it sense. Like I, I understand that feeling though. I realize I probably say, "Am I making sense?" Every other video, I everybody realize has, that. Yeah, but everybody has the things they like. They're like catchphrase. You know, everybody has those few. That's it's gonna be like so have. when when there is a purple noon merch. You, what what's your merch gonna say? Because mine is gonna say, "Am I making sense?" Oh, mine is gonna say, "Yeah, yeah, I I definitely agree." Yeah, that, that's what mine is gonna say because I say that every five minutes. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Or or my husband because I bring him up a lot apparently. So th- that's what I'm gonna say. That's what my merch is gonna say. Wow. Okay. Well, um, start a petition, guys, if you want to see some merch. It's going to take a little bit, but if you want it, we'll get it. (laughs) You want just a little mug on one side that says, uh, am I making sense? And on the back that says, yeah, 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 I I agree. (laughs) It's the worst merch ever. The worst merch ever. That's what's coming up, guys. That's what you have to look forward to. Oh, man. All right. So without further ado, let's talk about Under the Sun of Satan. So before we get into whether or not we recommend, don't recommend, as you know, we always like to introduce the film. So Under the Sun of Satan is based off a book by Georges Bernanos. I'm not French. I do not speak any other language. So please bear with Um, Georges Bernanos. And um, it was directed by Maurice Pialat or Pialet. I'll just go with Pialat since I, I'm not sure. But it stars, um, the three main stars are Gerard Depardieu, Sandrine Bonner, and the director himself, Maurice Piala. And the plot is a priest stuck in rural congregation and burdened with overwrought spirituality finds purpose in a troubled woman accused of murder. So before we get into the details, Savannah, what did you think of this film I really really liked the story and I guess I would have to accredit that to the book the story in this film is very very interesting and I really like the relationship or whatever I guess you could call it between the priest and the woman um so I really really like the story I think it's crazy it takes you on a ride but one of the problems with this movie is I was confused a lot of it. Like, I mm-hmm. I called Stephanie in between, and I was just like, hey, have you watched it? Because I have questions. It's definitely a movie that I would do some research on going in before so you can understand everything about it because there, this movie is kind of um, disorienting. Or mm-hmm. watch or read the book. I, I now am kind of contemplating on reading the book because I love the story that much but unfortunately it's just the story does get confusing but the movie you know the plot itself is amazing uh there's a lot I like about it I do like a lot of the actors cinematography even some of the music is really good Mm -hmm. but there is that issue what do you think stuff I I was just telling Savannah before this because, you know, before we get on here and we talk about it, we just kind of say, did you like it? Did you don't? And we just kind of see what we're going to be expecting to talk about in terms of how we do these reviews. Mm-hmm. Now, this is one of those films where it it's not so much as, oh, there were things I would change about the story. 
absolutely not. I think the story is brilliant. And by far, if we were talking about like movies that I think were had the were written the best, this could easily be in my top 10. However, Mm -hmm. the brilliance of this story is not conveyed well. It is it, it takes a little bit of digging to understand exactly what is going on. And I think that's it's a little sad for that because of how brilliant the actual story is. I just think there was a disconnect between the story and the dialogue and a, definitely a disconnect between the, the story and the directing. And I'm not saying that the directing or um, the, the dialogue was bad. It just didn't convey and explain enough what exactly was going on. And it, and it, I think that's also where people go half and half because like I said, if I didn't do the digging of the film, I don't think I would have fully understood it. And by digging, I mean, I re looked up the plot summary, a more detailed version. And I also did read um, a review by slant magazine to kind of help me put things together. And that does, and that can hinder a view of a film, but even despite that, I I still enjoyed the movie, and it's been adapted three times. This film, oh, Under the Sun of Satan, is the third adaptation. So, with only that, keeping that in mind, and like I think like the other two came out less than thirty years, you know, before this one. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering if it's just one of those scripts that is extremely hard to adapt and I can't really put that blame on the director or any of the directors before that now like I said I don't know anything about the two other films before that they do have different titles um one of them is called Mouchette and the other one is called I think um like a farm priest or or something in the lines of that you know what Um, the actual book is called is it called Under the Son of Satan or no it is called Under the Son of Satan Uh, okay okay that or I've seen French versions just go by Mouchette so, but I think English translation, because I tried looking up the book, because I was like, I kind of want to read this. It is on Amazon under Under the Son of Satan as a book. So I think it keeps that title. And also uh, the first two uh, uh, mediums, the first two movies that were made of this, it could have been at a time where using the name Under the Son of Satan was not as socially acceptable as it became in the 80s and even now today. All right. But- Overall, I think this is not necessarily a, a, a diamond in the rough, but a bril- like a diamond that needs polishing. Isn't that you a know, diamond in the rough? Yeah, a diamond in the rough then. <laughs> we've been saying this a lot, but it just has a lot of potential that wasn't met. Yeah, but this is the first time I think we're going to be talking about a film, not where the story itself needs change, but everything around it needs to be changed. Because I think, like, um, we talked about The Passenger, and we talked about Five Against the House, and every time we talked about it, we manipulated the storytelling, or rather the story, not the way the story was told. Mm -hmm. So I think this is so far our first time of us saying, like, the story was set and was ready to rock and roll. It was the directing and dialogue and creative decisions that prevented that story from being told as good as it is, you know, I, that's my opinion of it, but let's, so now we're getting into the spoiler zone. Now let's discuss characters. Yeah. What Uh, did you think? Let's talk about our main dude, Donasan, played by (laughs) Gerard Depardieu. Donasan, I'm not sure if. He's Dante. From the movie, right? No, it's, it's not Dante. It's some, no, 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 no. He is, he's from another movie. Is it not? It's it, huh? mm, it's not Dante. It's it's Danton. Danton? Danton. What are you talking Danton. about? Danton. It's, it's Danton. That's where this what? actor's from. Danton. What? What are you talking about? Look up. It's either Danton or Danton. That's where he's what, from. Is that the name of the movie? Yes. What? Look it up right now because I'm not crazy because I saw it. That's where I know this main actor from. Danton. Why I do you know him from, like, he played Porthos. I know him from that too, but he's also that guy. Look it up right now, Steph, because I'm not going to have I'm you looking, looking at him. Because 
Because I was like, either I'm pronouncing it wrong. I could be butchering okay, the name. Danton. Danton. I thought, okay. I don't know why. First I thought I you Dante. were trying to say. Yeah. First you said Dante. I thought you were trying to first say that he, this reminds you of Dante's Inferno. And I was like, okay. But then no. when you said Danton, Danton, and, but when you pr- mispronounce it, I thought you were trying to say that he played D'Artagnan. And no. Three Musketeers. No, you're not crazy. It is Danton. I've never okay. seen Danton. That's where I know him from. And then I know him from, is it Man in the Iron Mask or Three Musketeers? Yes, that's where he played Porthos. Okay. Okay. But yeah. Okay, so you're not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's talk about uh, his character. So I don't know if uh, Donasan is his actual name or if it's like the translation for priest um but regardless what did you think of gerard depado's character i like his confliction and i like the fact that this is someone that is struggling spiritually and one of the things that i think this movie strength is i mean we'll talk about what i thought of his performance and what i thought of the writing and stuff but you know this priest realized at some point that just because he's a priest, that doesn't mean you're not going to be confronted with morality, uh, you know, your faith being tested. And at some point, he does struggle with his faith after seeing, like, evil prevail with this young girl. Mm-hmm. Um, and multiple points, I-, I would assume, in the priest's life. Unfortunately, I didn't understand what he was struggling with in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Because it seemed like when at the beginning of the movie, he's reaching out to this uh, his uh, his this other priest, I assume, right? Um, yeah, and that's uh, that's uh, the played by the director of this film. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, for some reason, I felt like this priest was suffering some guilt, and I assume that's because he was struggling with his faith. And as a priest, that's very looked down upon, and. Although I did like the dialogue and interaction where the other priest was like, you know, we don't rely on human intervention because that's going to fail. And you could see the main priest, like he goes to hit himself at some point or uh, whip himself with a with a leash or whatever. It wasn't a leash, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah, with the whip, with like the metal chain that he yeah, used as a whip. like out of punishment because he feels like he needs consequence. I had a really hard time trying to understand what it is that brought him to that point and what was the point because I didn't really see him progress or find purpose until he meets the girl but that's later on in terms of acting I think he did a really good job with what he was given Mm -hmm. I don't think it falls very much on the actor I just think that for me at least I had a hard time understanding the priest what about you yeah I I loved the character Donison and I personally had to rewatch a few scenes. And like I said, I read um, a few movie reviews here and there. The one that helped me the most understand was by slant magazine. Um, But I I really enjoyed, not only did I enjoy uh, Deb Pardo's acting, Mm. but in the story, even though it's not necessarily conveyed well, his purpose and stuff like that, what we're, what we're supposed to get. And what I mean by story, I'm not, Um, talking about what I read in the book, I'm talking about what this story was trying, what this movie was trying to convey, Mm -hmm. but it struggled to convey. And I thought it was a brilliant character because you have this priest who is struggling. He thinks he is a horrible priest. He does not think that he belongs. He thinks he's an idiot. And so much to the point where, as Savannah said, he self punishes himself. And I, and I, I love this film because it's such a different view of religion that I've ever seen. Not necessarily that I agree, because it is a dark view of the, of this religion, but I love the fact that how different this book view, or rather this story viewed religion. And I thought this character, the Donison, um, I thought he heightened it. I, I loved his character. Now, did the conv- character portray who he really was. I don't think so. I think there was not enough dialogue between the main character and himself to fully comprehend everything. I also think um, there wasn't enough dialogue between De Pardo um, and the director's character, uh, Pia Lott's character, um, 
to convey the gravity of what was going on. Um, and it also could be because, you know, this is um, a French film and we're, wa- we're watching it dubbed. Maybe there could be some, I don't want to say translation er- um, errors, but maybe some some words, some terms and phrases of how the story was told in French is just not meshing well in English. That could have been a possibility too. But I, I absolutely love this character because you have this character who like I said, is, is not in his eyes is not a good priest. Mm -hmm. And in the moment, so I got very confused on how the priest and, um, Mouchette, how their worlds collide. And what I wish was more emphasized was because this was one of the scenes I had to go back and rewind and watch was when Adonison is putting the, the bread Mm-hmm. in her mouth during the communion he takes a pause and it kind of like he freezes and in that moment it jumps and it's it's just too small of a pause to realize that it's him knowing what she's already done at that moment so that confused me a lot because i was like okay she you know she, the priest sees her then the this girl kills and then it does all this and then now all of a sudden he knows it was because i don't know if you had that issue savannah but i didn't realize that he was going through her flashback i have yeah i had no idea i don't think that was clear at all like and even when you were talking about like this guy he feels like he doesn't fit in he feels horrible that was something i didn't grasp till a good portion of the movie though till we're in like more than half of the movie because I just felt like there were a lot of things that maybe we were supposed to assume on our own um, that weren't clear. But one of my favorite scenes of the movie, and I think my favorite scene that has the priest in it, is the scene where he's walking in this giant field. Great cinematography, uh, cinematography, by the way. Yeah, yeah. He, this person confronts him. I don't remember the man's name, but the man, I think, because he starts talking about all the stuff, represents evil or even Satan himself. Because in, in when he was talking to him, he's just like, okay, you're the devil. Um, but the way I saw that is I think that's probably the strongest point of the movie because we could all understand that, like, if you're religious, we all come into a point of our lives where we're confronted or have a test with evil or sin, if you're not religious, then you all have a life that, you know, you're confronted with morality. And I Mm -hmm. really like the imagery of that scene because I feel like that's something everybody can get. And, you know, at the end of it, the priest didn't like, I guess, uh, submit or just fall for what this man was saying. But that was my favorite scene because I did feel like it was clear to the audience. And I think it showed that, not, you know, just because he's a priest, it doesn't mean he's immune to evil. Yeah. And, you know, that sort of thing. I thought, so, with that, so, it, it was the the horse trader. The horse trader is the one who's accompanying him. So, he already has the knowledge of what he knows on how evil Mouchette is. He already has Mouchette. the knowledge of how e- evil Mouchette is. <laughs> like and that name. I know. Uh, <laughs> and so, he's on his way to see her knowing what he knows. And even before he knows this information about her, he is plagued by this weight and he does not know his weight. And when this horse trader who then identifies himself as Satan says, you've looked very close in yourself, but you still haven't realized what it is. And it's because this priest deep down inside realizes that in this world that he's living in, and his belief is that, God doesn't surround him. It's Satan. That the yeah. devil is around him at all costs. And there's a line in there where he's like, um, where he pretty much says, not God is dead, but he says like, um, us humans are, take, are, you know, we are under the devil's demise as well as God. And it's this realization. And I thought it made for this great character arc like this whole way of storytelling because here is this priest knowing that he can't tell anyone of this because obviously he would look insane 
Because yeah. it's not – it's one thing to say the devil is near, the devil is around. But to say we are all blind, the devil is everywhere, and we are just God's dogs because God doesn't have the strength to combat it. It's this – to me, that is like insane. Like, And, and keep in mind, this director is – atheist and i do applaud him for not making this story it it doesn't no one is a hero in the story and no one in by any way like shape or form condones the religion aspect that he believes in this film that this main character believes like you have this priest character who believes in that but no in every fiber of his being it's wrong and i thought it was just you and this character is someone who fears satan but rather than siding with God, he chooses to get closer to Satan to att- to combat his fear. Uh-huh. And that is, just for me, like, very different from anything I've ever seen or read. Especially in the role it, of a priest, you know? Yeah, it's not like, you know, it's not like a movie like The Exorcist or where the a priest comes face to face with a demon or the devil or whatever it may be. And it's like, I still have God on my side. It's almost like this representation of this, the devil, like he's talking to the devil and he's like, I know God isn't on my side, but I still can defeat you. And I, I just think that way of like that plot concept and people might disagree. I think this is a very, especially the way this film is told. It could be pretty ambiguous. You could pick and choose what you want to believe this character is going through, but that is what I think the brilliance no, I mean, about this character is. It's definitely about this character losing his faith. A hundred percent. There's, there's no denying that this person has sadly for most of the movie, not going towards evil, but also not having the strength to go towards God. And yeah, because he see that it, it's movie. it's in order to do something with his life, he works with Satan to do good. And there's this, um, like for example, um, and this is kind of just skipping towards one part of the end um, when he is reviving a child you know he's been called to a home to pray over a child he doesn't pray um after he revives the kid he says father forgive me because he knows that he didn't go to god to revive the kid he went to the devil Mm -hmm. and i think that is just like mind-blowing and um it's just in my he's doesn't he's not asking for God's help because in his eyes Satan is stronger. So the moral dilemma is that this priest knows that he's casting himself further and further and deeper into hell and into pain just for the sake of helping others and knowing in his eyes the truth. Yeah, yeah. I think for I guess for my perspective, yeah, the the revival of the kid, I think maybe no, I think that's we should talk about that at the ending of the movie. But okay, okay. I did want to move on to the to the girl. Mouchette. And why she was such a big part of the story. Because mm-hmm. she's, you know, there's a whole extra, I would say, 45 minutes where she's not in the movie that we see yeah. afterwards. So I do want to talk about why she's such a big character in the movie. Okay, so um, this character, Mouchette, she is, in a quick summary... She murders one of her lovers, then tries to just show off her baby bump to another lover after confessing her the murder she did, but no one believes that she did it. The only person who knows and believes is Donison. Yeah. Which, first Dude, of all, you have this girl... She, yeah, this girl... 16 years old, sleeping around with everyone, sneaking out of her parents' house. And the fact that she's looking at this person and saying, and I don't know who this person was. I might have been her therapist, what it seemed like, but. I think she was also her lover. Yes, definitely. She was also because she was saying like, oh, yeah, I'm I'm pregnant with your kid, but it don't matter because it's not going to be born. And it's like, holy crap. Like, can you write anyone like 
more twisted because it's like you just go from this girl saying i love you i want to be with you and then he's like nah you're just a kid and she kills him and the next day she's pregnant and then she's flaunting it off and she's like oh yeah i killed this dude don't you want to know the truth and he's like i don't believe it and it's just like what well this what this, she's, she's clearly mentally unstable like just the way yes. she even talks like she screams for no reason in one part of the movie she's very on like an unstable and first of all like she's supposed to be 16 which to me is yeah. crazy young for this for her depth of a character yeah which also i do think i wondered what would have happened because clearly in my eyes she does not look 16 the actress who plays her does not look 16 i really wonder what would have happened if they got someone who actually looked 16 and how that would have impacted the film i think it might have been a little at the time maybe a little bit too strong for audiences it would have been jarring yeah it would have been a lot to see like what really is a little girl doing all this stuff and having affairs pregnant and especially what happens to her later in the movie i think it would have been a lot you're right Mm -hmm. so she forms this unlikely relationship with the priest where the priest knows exactly what she did. And like, there's almost like when she, even when she's saying exactly what she did to this therapist slash lover and he's like, I don't believe you. And even if it was true, his, his death was already murdered as a suicide. Um, she, she gains like this sense of arrogancy, which is then cut down immediately. The moment the priest is like, Hey, I know what you did. I saw it. And she completely changes tone. She goes from, you know, almost like a, a controlled by Satan character to now actually who she is just a young frightened girl. Yeah. Yeah. There was definitely a switch for sure. Um, for me, I thought she was sort of like the priest's little project in a way. Like he kind of latches on to this girl and like this is what kind of gives him purpose in a way. Yeah, it definitely felt like an, a, a redemption. Like this was with knowing what he knew, this could have redeemed him. For sure. And, and like you kind of see that in his desperation when he talks or when he confronts her that one day. And it was kind of like, if I can do this, then like, this will be it. If I can just win her back, if I could, if I could show her, you know, whatever. And it, it's really sad when, you know, so basically after her and the priest have a conversation, she does end up killing herself. And it's very sad because you kind of see like the priest completely defeated, completely loses his faith completely just over it and the biggest thing though i think which i thought was a little so one of the one of the still confusing areas to me was how the priest was called there after she kills herself i wasn't sure how he got there like i don't know if he had another vision and saw um, like I said, those little visions and moments where he was supposed to figure out things were just way too quick to put things together. Cause it seemed like she killed herself and immediately boom, like 30 minutes later, he's there. Yeah. That was off. I, 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 the reason I, I just assume he might've still been there because of how quick he was, you know, I figured to too. Her. And then also he, it seemed like he knew first before the mother. So it's not like the mother had called or rang for him. Um, it, it just seemed like because she starts the mother starts freaking out when he's holding her and bringing her down the stairs and i think one of the crazy things because this film is actually supposed to be set in the 1920s and that was another what? thing i thought was yeah i thought 1920s. that was 20s yeah 1920s 1930s i don't that was not conveyed well in, at all it it did feel like the year it took place and i would have never got that me either it was just i was like huh but um this girl so this girl he brings rather than bringing her so like the mother doesn't know no one knows and no one's processed yet the fact that she's committed suicide only the priest knows and everyone like is baffled at what the priest because rather than bringing her to a doctor he brings her to the church 
And everyone is like, what are you doing? And even, um, I'm not sure if it was a cardinal, but one of the higher up priests says like, that's, that's old world. Yeah. So I, and I thought it was weird. It felt a little creepy because it, it kind of did feel like, well, not only, cause not only was this scene creepy, because when he's bringing her to this the, the church's altar and he's like leaning against her, it feels off. And what I mean by that is it feels sexually driven and it's yeah. weird. But I honestly, if you don't know like what the priest's like motive is, like you would think like he's interested in her. Like, if you weren't too sure. Because I kind of was just like, oh, is this film going to go a different way at some points? So, yeah, it, it, it was off with that. Because, like, obviously he wasn't, he wasn't praying over her. He wasn't – he literally just presses his face against her face and then has blood all over his lips. Yeah, and it's nasty. like, what? And then also, speaking on the f- topic of, like, gross and weird, the fact that this dude – the 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 horse trader kisses him too and is like it's a friendly kiss it's like what What you just kissed a priest (laughs) you just kissed a priest was that the devil or was that the other guy yeah that was the devil that was the horse trader i mean i need and he just kisses him and and their part of us characters like huh and he's like oh don't worry it was just a friendly kiss yeah and it's like was that like i don't know if that was supposed to be like the kiss of death or like you know some type of so that's what sway. i thought it was i was just kind of like oh it's the kiss of death or it's like his uh relationship with satan is now like confirmed but yeah it was weird because how are we else were we supposed to get that I just yeah and so like then it was with that thought was him because you don't really see if he kisses her was he supposed to do a kiss of death to mouchette thinking that there was some demon or devil inside of her Mouchette, probably. Like, um, why else would he kiss her? Because I let's be honest, he he's I don't think they had a relationship outside of like the confrontation of what she literally did. it was like what twelve hours they hung out. <laughs> like, <laughs> twelve hours probably was so, the like, time frame. I would assume it would have to do with like the kiss of death and you know, all that stuff. But it's definitely, like, it's just one of the things that should have been clear in the film. Because it definitely came across a little, a little strange, if you know what I mean. Yeah, there was a, definitely a rough, in terms of, like, how the script went from, to the screen, a rough translation for that scene. Um, but, it, yeah, like, it's just, it like, I'm thinking about it now and I'm like, was it the kiss of death? Did maybe this guy have some weird fascination with her i mean he already got kissed by a dude he got kissed by her and he gets a kiss in the end so like maybe he's just like i don't care anymore like it's just very like the motives behind those were not clear and i think it should have absolutely been clear because it would have added a more cohesiveness to the story um so i do want to talk about the ending of the movie because i do feel like I'm a little confused. <laughs> yeah, and so you have a pretty good because you said a lot of things that I I didn't even think of in the movie that actually make a lot of sense. So I did want to ask some questions. Ask um, away. So after the whole resurrection of the child that that you actually brought up, he mm-hmm. kind of goes back to I would say his room or to the church, and would you say he's talking to God at that point? I think he's trying to, but at that point, he can't. Because in that moment when he's writing down and he's trying to talk, he is taken aback and is in pain. And that's where I meant by he's not using God to keep him away from Satan. Rather, he's using Satan's own power to do good, to make, you know, right from the wrong that he did. And, but with that, I think it comes with the price and he's not only what I would imagine to be casting himself into hell, but casting himself into his own death. I, okay. See, that's kind of, besides the Satan's power thing, I did see that he was sort of like, 
killing himself in a strange way. Um, and for me, I, I think it represented towards the end of our lives, you know, I guess in terms of religion, we're going to have to, you know, face God or face hell. And I feel yeah. like that represented a really good, his death really, because he dies, he doesn't die then, right? He dies in the... Uh, he literally dies in the church. Yeah. And I also notice he starts having his issues in the church. While he's in the church is where things start happening. And I think at that moment, it's kind of like he already knew something was overtaking him. He already knew that he was falling weak to something. And I think also him going through like a beautiful cinematography, beautiful, beautiful cinematography, especially when they're in the fields. But I thought when he's walking in the fields, I kind of thought I was like, is this trying to show us that he's straying away from God's light, that he's on the wrong path? Okay, that's interesting. Because I, I, I just thought I think yeah, because I think everybody because from for me, I knew that this was about a man that lo- loses his faith and essentially can't come to God anymore and eventually comes to confrontation with the devil. The thing I didn't understand, and you're making it clear now is that he succumbs to Satan pretty much. and yeah, and I don't think it's because beca- he doesn't believe in God. I think he believes, but he, Something tells him to accept the fact that Satan is greater and bigger than God. So yeah, rather it, than yeah. using the power of God on his side to do whatever he needs to do, he instead gets closer to Satan and uses his own power knowing it's going it like a double-edged sword, if that makes any sense. Like it, it's a double-edged sword because he he's using what's most powerful, what he can summon spiritually, In the moment, but at a price that's killing him. Yeah, it's the kiss of death. Um, what was I going to say? And I think this movie talks a lot about the, it's like, yeah, like I said, like there's a choice, I guess, all of us in a way have to make in terms of morality, in terms of our own morality. Either we're going to go one way or we're going to go the other. If you're religious, there's God and there's sin. And I think that's a really clear aspect of the movie. But unfortunately, I, you know, I'm disappointed I didn't get that part of the film. I think I would have... Because that's a game changer. Like the entire, like adding in that huge moral dilemma is a game game changer for the way the story is and for the movie. And it is a lot more controversial than I thought then because I didn't know that he was using Satan's power, really. And then I I could understand why people are like, oh, (laughs) all righty. So... But I I thought, and I, I just thought because, you know, we've seen movies where it's priesthood judging the concept of god but i've never seen one where it's he judges the concept of god's strength in relation to the devil and i thought that itself was brilliant i don't agree <laughs> i don't no, agree that with I, that. i'm very christian so you know i'm just like oh no so um <laughs> i don't agree Spooky. either but obviously i think if this movie, the thing I, I I wish it would have done is make that clearer. Because like you said, we don't get a lot of films about, in general, about people walking away from their faith, especially priests and, and people that are really, really deep in the religion. So I think that's very interesting that you have this person that pretty much devoted their whole life to a fellowship with God. And at one point, he's just like, I'm not seeing it and I'm not worthy so because I'm not worthy and because I'm just losing faith, because I'm seeing all this evil, I'm going to go in the other direction. And I wish it would have made it clear because then, like you said, the whole movie is completely different now, you know? Yeah, but now it, it just went from a priest losing sight to now even more giving him a challenge. Because now, at the end of the day, like with religion and priesthood, what you do is an act of God. And obviously you make sacrifices but this priest, in reality, is making the ultimate sacrifice for good. And it sucks that it's not conveyed in that way. It sucks that it's not conveyed in that because if we're talking about it like that, then this priest is the holiest of the holy, knowing that he's doing and helping. And he's fearful because he knows any good act he does, he is using it based off Satan's strength, not God's. It's very controversial. Very 
For sure. So with this ending, so he is called to revive a, or, you know, pray over a child with meningitis and he's afraid. And I think he's afraid because he knows like, this could be my last work. This could be my last day. And he makes a and choice he, eventually. He makes a choice instead of praying to God to rile up Satan. Yeah. And to use, whatever and to use that strength, yeah. knowing the, the cost of what it's going to cost him. Um, so I, I just, I thought that was, and I can't stop talking about how fascinating that was to me. You know, this guy, he does it. He takes the rosaries off the kid and lifts him up in the air and says, and, and, and says something in the line of like, who are you? Are you the boy or something else? And pretty much ask is whatever demon or devil, whatever it may be to leave rather than asking God to kill or to s go away. So, and then the kid opens up his eyes and stuff and he's groggy, but then his mother comes in and once again, this priest is kissed on the lips. <laughs> it's like, whoa, okay. <laughs> Shouldn't, I mean, understand he, he just did a miracle, but still. Um, but yeah. And so the way it ends is he goes the next day to church and, uh, goes back to uh, performing his regular duties and he's in the confession and listening to someone's confession was his last hurrah and he passes in the confession booth which by the way was shot beautifully that little blue that little blue light on his face awesome loved it but I loved it and it kind of at the end it kind of gives the appear uh, the appearance that his friend um, played by the director knew about this because he's not surprised when he dies. I mean, yeah, the, the other priest is kind of with him on this journey. And I'm sure at some point he figured, oh, wait, he's, you know, at first it was just the fact that he didn't think he was worthy and that he was all this stuff. But then at some point you do see there is a shift in the priest. So I, I do think at some point, like, I don't think he knew everything, but you know, he probably knew something. I was hoping if, if this film were to ever be remade, I would have enjoyed more if they made the, the other priests played by the director, um, almost like a Virgil in Dante's Inferno where he knows. And you get the sense that he, you know, he knows, but he guides him more so in the right direction, more apparently, like it's understandable because yeah, I didn't like really the, understand the that. the devil and the angel on the shoulders. That's what I would have yes. liked to see. I would have liked to see more of the choice being made. I would have liked to see like the priest, if, if this is what the film was about, I would have liked to see the priest make that choice very clearly on what he is going to do because you don't And I think that. also- Another another thing that would have made the film, I think, a little bit more clear is if it did add some type. And I'll, I'll use the word supernatural element loosely because everything seems a little too human for what the story is trying to convey. There could have been a little bit more something almost unrealistic to kind of have us see further what this priest is seeing because everyone he sees is just you know a horse trader going i'm the devil dude and it's like there could be a little bit more in terms of convincing like yeah. this dude was sold the minute this horse trader came by he's like i'm the <laughs> devil he's like i knew it like it sh should have been a little bit more in, yeah. in my opinion, at least especially, not necessarily a little bit more for the character, but more for the audience to understand. I didn't believe he was a devil at first. I thought, like, it was more of, like, oh, like, figurative. Like, you know how people are, like, get behind me, devil, and stuff like that? But then I thought I he was drunk the first time I watched this scene. I thought, I was like, oh, he's this priest is accompanied by this belligerent <laughs> drunk. Yeah, so I think if this movie were remade, definitely more apparent with the choice and I would have liked to see more of like because let's be honest even though the movie is based in a church and priests and stuff you don't really see another person in his life being like god god can do this and that and 
the Lord and all your, you know, because at some point he did believe in God. At some point that was his strength. And we don't see that ever come up in the movie. Yeah. And I think to, like, some oh, type- let me, like, let me read the Bible. Let me, let me pray. Let me, let me just do like, there's no let struggle. Let me whip myself. <laughs> there's no struggle in this movie about him tr- at least trying to get closer to God before he makes that choice. It's almost like when he met the devil, he was just kind of like, cool. Easy. You know I what do I mean? Wish, it was just no, strange. yeah, yeah. yeah. It, I do wish there was some type of like scene in his life that gave him this thought of maybe what he thinks he doesn't know. Because at this point, he's just like, "I'm just a crappy priest," and it's like, <laughs> "But why? But why?" <laughs> but the thing is, the one thing I even struggle with now is. Even an atheist, I, I have a hard time believing an atheist would even go running towards the devil, let alone a religious person running towards the devil without some sort of explanation, without some sort of str- like internal that's struggle. That's just what it, yeah, like, and we don't know that without knowing the background of it. And so like to, if you just watch a movie without listening to any of the background or reading any of the background, you just think like, so this priest just went like rogue, like a Sith. <laughs> and it's like, no, like there's there's purpose to this and it should have been explained. It should have been explained because like I said, that moral dilemma of a priest having to do bad to do great is awesome. But it's not explained. I think that's it's not explained. You that's why think I think he, he made a pact with the devil. And that's not what it was. But you think it was. And again, I don't think me, I'm a, I, I'd say I'm a regular Christian. If the devil comes around, I'm not going to be like, you know, you're making some good points. Especially not- if he's taking the shape of a horse seller. <laughs> like you're just not, and, and not even like a Christian, a Catholic person, just a regular, let's just say non-religious person. I don't see them running towards the devil. So why would this priest, Why? And they didn't explain it, besides the fact that he doesn't think he has any self-worth. Doesn't. Yeah, and I, that's not and a good excuse to go follow the One of the, the things I realized, too, was that if someone doesn't understand this film, it can easily mislead to the fact that, like, I was thinking about, I was like, you know, if someone watched this, they would could probably have the inclination that the priest has, like, un, like fallen in love slash obsessed with this girl. Yeah. Because of the way it's portrayed. And obviously, in recent media, there's been a lot of no-nos in terms of in the Catholic Church and, you know, things like that, especially pedophilia. So it's like even more today, when this movie is played today, because it does not popular, it's not popularly like conveyed correctly. It, not you, only yeah. can you say, like, not only does it support the devil, but it supports pedophilia. And that's That's awful. the thing, because, like, it, let's be honest. If you, because it took me a minute when you said he was using Satan's power. I was just like, what did I watch? Do I need to read my Bible? But I do understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to open up my Bible and be like, nope, in Jesus' name, not today. <laughs> like, Amen. There's a lot of people, including myself, that if you were to just, if I were to just see it and been like, oh, he likes the devil now, turn off because I don't want to watch that. I don't want to watch a priest that is obsessed with a 16-year-old and after she kills herself goes swinging, you know, hand in hand with the devil because you can see it like that. You can totally think, watch this film and be like, no, I don't like this. If anyone were to remake this, I think this would have to be more guided as a horror film or suspense or thriller than a drama. This because has to be a horror film. For sure. And I think, honestly, like, I'll say it, like, I'd love to remake it if anyone wants to hit me up. Um, but you have to do if it the I right wasn't way, going 100%. to, I think Robert... Eggers, the director of The Lighthouse, could Oof. make this film. Hit it on the head. The witch, brilliant. He could do it. So I, I, I hope this, and it's like, I understand, like, 
And I, we always talk about like oh, remakes and stuff. It'll be the fourth remake in 40 years <laughs> if this film was remade. But I think it's, it's had so many remakes because it's a good film that just hasn't been conveyed properly. And, and I think it, it should just, be a, it's, I think you made a great point about it being a horror film because at the end of the day, the it's devil spooky. is evil. The devil is evil. And you have to portray it like that. You have to portray like, all right, maybe he's using it for something else, but it's still coming from an evil, dark place. And I feel like that they also didn't go to do a good job at conveying like, and I understand the film was made by an atheist, but not a Satanist. You know what I mean? Like we yeah. can all agree the devil represents evil and disgusting and harm and all this stuff. And I don't think it did a good job at this come whatever is happening to him, it's coming from a really dark, bad, ugly place. And I feel like a horror movie could really, really do some great imagery with that. And I think also, too, even though it was made by an atheist, it still is overall pretty neutral. But because of that lost in translation, it can come across the wrong way. No, I so agree. I, I, this, yeah. this film, I, I do think, is a know, diamond in the rough. Yeah, I don't think it's pro Satan or anything. I just think that, like, you have to be paying very close attention and even then do some research. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's – I think it attributes to dialogue and attributes to some directing choices. I don't think that makes it a bad film. Like how it is on its own, I don't think it's a bad film. But it does not do justice to what the actual story is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that being said, what would you rate it? Uh, a seven. No, 6.5 because I don't like the devil. Oh, you went lower. I thought you were going to go higher. For the Lord. I can't be giving a devil <laughs> on seven. You know, like, <laughs> no, 6.5 because at the end of the day, like, I completely missed that point. You brought up a lot of points that I, I didn't even realize. Um, So until those I probably things get cleared up completely, I, I don't think it deserves more than a six and a half. And it's sad because I do like the plot, but I didn't grasp enough of it so that's why that's fair i would give it oh i love the plot so much i love it like after like like i said in the beginning it's one of those things where if it was conveyed more it easily could have been my top 10 movies um because of that because of the story alone it brings it to an eight and i know i know there's just something about this film that really tickles my fancy um the cinematography would bring it up to an eight point two, but I everything else those that those other points could have been it, it, if this had been conveyed the way it should have been conveyed ten out of ten ten out of ten ten out of ten every time. But because it wasn't conveyed how well the story was, the story itself for me gets an eight. Cinematography an extra point two. Oh yeah, I'll give the cinematography like an eight because it was beautiful. Like the everything was done well. It's just you know. Unfortunately, I, I didn't. I guess I didn't get half of the movie, so you know. But hopefully, somebody listens to this and decides to remake it for the fourth time and do it right. Oh. Do it horror. Or a studio in France listens to this and goes, "Hey, Stephanie, Miss Conti, we're waiting." My last name is spelled the French way: C O N T I, not C O N T E. So technically, it's a sign. I do have some right. <laughs> To make this film. Um, would and you do it in my French pr- or in English? I would have to have. I would. Ooh, Savannah. Questions, that's, questions, that's questions. A, that's a hard one because you know. I would probably do it in French, just to maintain my roots. And by roots, I mean just simply the fact that my last name is spelled the French way, <laughs> despite being half. Spanish and half Italian. And honestly, honestly, who would I would cast in it? Jean Dujardin. Jean Dujardin, 10 out of 10. Jean Dujardin. Where is he from? I know that name. The artist. Oh, yeah, I know him. I know him. He's a good actor. Yeah. Um, all right, a French horror Probably film. I like it. Jean Dujardin and Lily Rose Depp. Oh, she's beautiful. You have to. 
I think there's a there's a production company called like Le Passé, Le Passé. Do a French I'm here. film, yeah. <laughs> Could you imagine? Like ever, like that would be something. My parents and my family would be like, "Christ, what is she doing?" Because like they'd be like, "Oh, Stephanie's directing." Oh no, is she directing a French horror film? They'd be like, "Christ, okay." <laughs> you know, I would go see it, of course. Of course you would. You would. They. I would probably only have like six releases in the United States, and you would travel to one of those states just to see it. I traveled all of them. Mm hmm. So, but all right. You heard it from us. As always, thank you, James, for. And James. if you want to be thanked every episode, like James, go to our Patreon and you can see the different tiers and stuff like that. And. If you didn't hear, Little Miss Me wrote a short story that is available on Amazon. It's called Idol by Stephanie Conti, and it's $2.85. Do it. So that's that's, Buy that's, it. that's like what? The price of a Coke? Not no, we're not, we're not in that high of an inflation yet. <laughs> uh, um, it will be come five years from now, it'll be the price of a Coke. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for listening, and you what, what next time? What, 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 oh, oh street card name desire. A classic. We're gonna tone it down a bit from the devil. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you everyone so much for listening and take care. Bye. Bye.